Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Nature Connection show. Every fourth Friday, we air this along with our friend and special guest co-host, fine art nature photographer, Margot Carrera. Uh, this show is really Hi, about Margo. nature, wildlife, <laughs> science, the environment. And today, it's all about fireflies. We love fireflies. If you've seen them in your yard, they're so exciting. Um, we've got recognized firefly expert and certified naturalist Benjamin Pfeiffer joining us. He's the founder Hi. of Firefly Conservation and Research. You can go to firefly.org to learn more. And I know we're recording this at not even fall yet, but it's the beginning of September and this mm. is airing on Black Friday. So I'm just saying, if you're listening on Black Friday, you know what you want to do this weekend. You want to support these kind of organizations. I'm just saying. So welcome, Ben. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me today, Lisa. Hey, cool. it's good to have you. And um, I know all of us are into fireflies. Um, it's something we see as kids. It's like, you know, lightning mm -hmm. bugs and, you know, they fly around. And I know we've all had a chance to chat with you uh, before this and um, this recording. And you talked about glowworms before, and I didn't know they were connected. But can you just, <laughs> give, what is a firefly? Are they across this country, around the world? And how important are they? Yeah, um, so it's a good question. Um, Fireflies are beetles, um, and they are all in the family Lampyridae, um, and all of uh, those members in the family Lampyridae glow as juveniles and as adults. Um, you can find them across the United States, um, pretty much in the lower 48, um, and you can find them in a lot of states that um, you might not think that they occur in, um, even all the way up to Utah and Colorado and Arizona and parts like that. Even California has some fireflies too, but they're very- Margo rare. gets to have one. <laughs> yeah. Margo, get out there and look for them. <laughs> I haven't seen any in San Diego, but maybe there's other places in California. Maybe at yeah. North. Yeah, so they're 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 pretty abundant across the the globe. Um, uh, many many countries have fireflies, um, and they're all pretty much in the family Lampyridae. Um, there's new species being described pretty regularly, um, and so there's still a good chunk hmm. of undiscovered species, uh, specifically um, in the tropical forests down in South America, um, even in parts of uh, Europe and stuff like that. They're still discovering new things. Um, out there. So um, a really diverse group um, and uh, really wonderful to have that, that, you know, we can all enjoy from year to year. Um, so I look forward to talking more about them as we get into this. Yeah. So you say mm. across this country, how many species do you think they, they're, we have? I mean, I didn't realize they were actual beetles too. I'm yeah. Just like, oh. mm. They yeah, just good keep question. Flying things. I thought they were flies, actually. <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes we like to call them squishy beetles because, like, you know, a lot of people are familiar with beetles with kind of the hard, like, shell that, you know, ex exoskeleton that, you know, but with mm -hmm. fireflies, they're kind of squishy. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people have stories about seeing fireflies when they're young and like squishing them in their hands and then seeing that glowing goo get all over things and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, oh. they're beetles. Um, and, um, uh, regarding um, the diversity in the United States, um, it's it's pretty uh, healthy. We've got about 180 species um, here in the United States, and that list is growing. It could be up to around 200 um, wow. at some point as well. Um, some of the states that have the highest diversity include like Georgia um, and Florida, and then also is, is Texas as well with around 40 species um, to 50 species. So a large amount of diversity. There's just a large amount of um, different various habitats in those particular states. And so that's what creates um, a lot of the diversity that you find in those particular areas. So if you're in one of those states, get out at night. Um, fireflies are um, going to be flashing um, in the fall in some of those places. So you might still be able to see some into November, um, late October timeframe. Mm. Mm. It's interesting because we're it's September now and we're in uh, eastern North Carolina on a farm and at night here they come and then mm -hmm. they go up into the trees and actually we're on a farm so I was playing with the chickens last night and one came right up to my face 
and just like buzz right there. I'm like, oh, you're a firefly, but I can't see your light yet. You're not lighting up because it was still that weird, you know, sundown when you put the chickens time, <laughs> chickens away time. <laughs> and but it just hung right there. And I was like, you're oh, that's it, really great. <laughs> yeah. So it's it, but they really do go up in the trees. And we didn't really mm -hmm. realize that. I think it was when we were in um Arkansas and then Maryland, we saw them really go up in the trees. Yeah. In fact, they were in the trees more in Maryland than on the ground. So I don't, what's going on in the trees? Are they, you know, having families or what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> having little parties up in the trees. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so fireflies will fly at different canopy heights. And in the early evening around dusk, um, usually they'll be hiding within like blades of grass or clump of grass or between pieces mm. of bark. Um, under a rock or something like that. And they come out um, and they start off slowly uh, by flashing kind of lower to the ground. And as the night progresses, um, you can kind of almost think of it like males are getting a little more desperate to find females. Um, and so they fly, they'll fly higher and mm -hmm. higher and higher in order to get their light visible to a female that might flash back at them. Um, and so they'll get wow. higher and higher into the canopy as the night progresses. And, and you can see this when you study habitats, um, you know, and you go out and you, you can easily catch them really quickly. And then as the night progresses about an hour later, hour and a half later, they're already way up in the top. Um, and uh, then it's over after that. Um, and so, you know, the, the height at which a firefly flies is also dependent upon the genus it comes from too. Um, some fireflies uh, prefer mm. to, to, to flash in those, those higher like uh, canopy heights up in the trees, for example, um, because uh, they might have a better chance to find a female in that location as well. Um, and so a, a lot of things have to go into their height and how they flash. Um, females will generally be kind of close to the ground, anywhere from around three to five feet. Um, and it's sometimes, um, you know, on a, a log as well, or, you know, uh, perched on a rock or something like that, just waiting for a right male to come by. Um, but if, if you get to know your, your local fireflies, uh, pay attention to how far <laughs> high they fly. Um, and this is a good way from night to night, you can kind of read the landscape a little bit better um, to say, oh, well, that's that species that flies really high when it's, when it's dusk. And, oh, this is, you know, the common type, Photinus pyralis, that, you know, flashes low and then gets a little higher. And so, You'll just educate yourself a little bit as you uh, get to know your local firefly population. I feel like we're going to be like a, so, you know, the the people calling in the airplanes, like, okay, you can land, but you yeah. can't. <laughs> so, the, how does a male tell a female from another male? I mean, if they're all flashing, are are their flashes different? Like the females flash differently than the males? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, a female is going to flash slightly different um, than a male. Um, okay. She is going to be perched on a piece of grass or a shrub or a stick or something like that. And she's looking for a male that kind of has the brightest flash or the faster flash rate. Um, okay. And that's there's some scientific research that's been done to kind of figure out what females like in certain males. Um, and uh, she will flash back at that male at a certain interval of time. So um, certain species will flash back sooner than others. Um, and it's one, it's another way that we kind of differentiate between different species sometimes. Um, hmm. Some like the common type of firefly will flash in about two seconds uh, to another male, for example, oh. whereas <laughs> another species like we have here in Texas will flash about you know, 0.6 seconds. So it's really quick and snappy. Wow. Um, other, other fireflies, um, females, um, don't have, can't fly. And so they're kind of a larval form. And oh. so they might, they might pulse a glow, like a yellowish glow towards a male so that like, um, you know, he can, she can see him, um, and then the male can find her. Um, and you know, there's, hmm. uh, different signals that females have to signal to different, to males as well. And some of them we just don't know exactly, you know, how they, they, you know, communicate with each other. Um, but hmm. they do have a courtship, I guess you could say flashing sequence. Um, and that's interesting to note. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, in certain genuses like Futurus, um, they will actually mimic the flash pattern of other species um, in order to lure in males. Um, and so this goes back to a, a type of uh, firefly in the genus Paturus that eats other fireflies. And so Ooh. they will mimic the flash pattern of wow. uh, 
other yeah i know interesting huh? oh no. <laughs> this is cool okay so i you know what i want to know that's like funny. this big thicket national preserve like that's out by houston and beaumont texas yep. i don't know if you've been out there but now big thicket has a carnivorous plant section all these pitcher plants and oh, yeah. everything and mm -hmm. and it's i want to go when there are like it we went in in uh february so they were they look like dried up little pitcher plants all singing like a little choir but i know that they're carnivorous so i never mm -hmm. knew that you know like there's cannibalism going on with fireflies here so would would do you think they're in that area that swampy kind of area and could like the pitcher plant eat the cannibalistic firefly <laughs> um yeah i would say that the pitcher plant could eat the firefly um, but the firefly would need to be attracted to that rotting smell um, in the pitcher yeah. plant that attracts other insects. So mm -hmm. it's unlikely that the they the the fireflies would be attracted to the pitcher plant. Um, could okay. they eat them? Yes, likely. Um, are they found in that area of East Texas um, in the big thicket? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, it's it's part of the big kind of. Uh, thicket of uh, forest that extends all the way from East Texas all the way up to the Mid-Atlantic, cool. basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a, a wide diversity of species up all the way up through there. Um, you know, if you're in East Texas by the Sabine Pass and uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That, that kind of area, um, you know, that's where there's a lot of diversity there, but it all kind of starts and you get a lot of overlap between Texas species and then some mid-Atlantic kind of sort of species. Um, but they love those swampy, wet areas. So um, Louisiana's got to have them too. Uh, yeah, Louisiana has got really great fireflies, um, you know, and um, that's a great place to, to go look at them. If you ever find a, a, a like a, a natural park um, uh, or like a nature area that's got a one of those bridges that kind of suspends through the swamps, um, mm -hmm. those are a great place to go and look at fireflies um, oh. because you'll be able to you know, get out there where they're going to be really active, but you won't have to get wet. And so, um, yeah. The, and you might yeah. see alligator eyes too at night. Yeah, you could see alligator <laughs> eyes. Um, you know, <laughs> I hear stories from cool. other firefly researchers about, you know, the perils of studying fireflies and swamps and marshes and stuff like that about the alligators and snakes and stuff. <laughs> snakes, so. I know. We yeah. just, we just saw all these water snakes up in uh, Asheville area. Oh my gosh. We had two species, yeah. five snakes in one place. I got so oh. excited. Uh, but it's, it, no, I'm sorry, but they're cool. But I want to go back cool. to Big Thick. And the reason why I asked was because, you know, learning that fireflies are beetles, I saw one of the biggest, most colorful, I think it's a rainbow beetle in Big Thicket. So, and it was by, he was hanging out by the pitcher plants. Oh, cool. And, and I know this sounds weird, but I know you're a naturalist. It looked like he did a little poopy. Now, do they do show poopies? Like, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> do fireflies poop? <laughs> no, I don't know. I know, but he did like this beetle, this big, I think he's a okay. rainbow scarab, a rainbow scarab beetle or something like that. Oh, I don't okay. know if I'm getting. And he looked mm -hmm. like it, she, I don't know what it was, but it looked like <laughs> a little poopy. He, and not a little, but like, I don't know if it was dirt, but it just was placed where you would think so i you know hmm. i'm i know welcome to our show where i ask about <laughs> all righty <laughs> then <for> yeah <laughs> what about well, firefly poop I do they poop i, I mean they have to they don't Everything. really yeah they don't really poop or, or a lot of them a lot of species don't even eat actually when they're adults um so they're they live for about three to four weeks at the most what? um i've kept one alive for 36 days at one time um, but that was because I was feeding it apples, but most of them don't eat. Um, what? And, they um, don't eat? Yeah, don't eat. They spend most of their life in a larval state um, as larva. Um, and so that's why um, it's one of the best uh, with a habitat hmm. certification program with the Firefly Habitat Program. We're looking to protect habitats that, um, you know, are good larval habitat um, because they spend like one to two years in that uh, state, basically. Um, and uh, this is a good way to identify, you know, those particular habitats and let, let people know that it's protected habitat. Um, but yeah, they don't live that long as adults, surprisingly. Hmm. So Margo in San Diego, if you want fireflies, you don't have to cook them dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't have to feed them. But, but what's okay, so hmm. if they're not eating, hmm. I mean, 
so they're flying lava larva but <laughs> you're giving the habitat so what do they need to survive like the right habitat wise yeah that's a good question um so um with the like the habitat certification program um we you know, after years of, of, of research and, and studying fireflies, we kind of narrowed it down to like four different requirements um, that are important for fireflies um, to survive. Um, and this habitat program basically seeks to um, ask people to provide these necessary um, elements uh, in, a, in a habitat for them to survive. And so really undisturbed cover for adults and growing larvae. Um, this is, uh, fireflies are most vulnerable to disturbance during their larval stage um, mm -hmm. and as adults during the mating season. Um, and so it's like these stages of development that are most critical to protect. So undisturbed basically means don't disturb the vegetation or ground when fireflies are active. Um, and, you know, we're encouraging people to, to protect larva um, during that time. There's lots of stories I've, I've heard over the years of bulldozers coming in and bulldozing places when fireflies are mating or laying eggs and, you know, that oh. destroys it basically. Yeah. Um, so that's one way and it's just, you know, let the habitat do its thing. Um, and then the second step is kind of encouraging plant diversity. Um, and the reason for this is that most fireflies are found in uh, riparian corridors or mm -hmm. that kind of narrow strip of vegetation that occurs along a river or a creek. Um, and that those plants hold in a lot of moisture in the soil, and it's what creates that humid, moist environment that fireflies mm -hmm. need in order to lay eggs in and attracts pests and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, encouraging plant diversity is really helpful. Um, and so either by either planting native plants or encouraging the diversity that's already there and protecting it. Um, so like avoiding shredding and mulching and mowing, um, you know, in areas where fireflies are, um, and uh, just kind of understanding what habitat degradation and loss contribute to firefly decline. Mm. Um, and then uh, reducing light pollution is another one. Um, and the main reason for this is that mm. it, um, females will have a hard time seeing males when there's a lot of artificial light at night. Um, and this basically, this contributes to mm. them not being able to see each other, they can't mate, and they can't produce offspring for the next year and the next season's a crop of fireflies, essentially. Um, so reducing, um, you know, light pollution and making some just wise choices on the on the light bulbs, uh, the bulbs that you use, um, using amber color, yellow uh, LED lights as opposed to the lights that are like bright white that wash out all mm -hmm. other colors of light. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in in the guide that comes along with the certification program, there's some some uh, suggestions on and definitely helpful tips that uh, ways that people can like change their existing outfit uh, in order to be a little bit more friendly for fireflies at night. Um, and then lastly is just restrictions on pesticide usage. Um, and so uh, mm -hmm. we're not saying eliminate it all, all completely. You know, we also have to deal with domestic pests, um, but uh, direct spraying of, of pesticides within like habitats um, and broad spectrum pesticides are, you know, we want to try to avoid if best we can. Um, and just being a little conscious of that. Um, and, you know, uh, rural land managers and agricultural areas too, this is also uh, helpful as well um, for just uh, being able to look at what's you're being sprayed on the land, how it's impacting the environment, the native habitat and the species that live there. So that's important, mm -hmm. like when you think about like golf courses and places like that, because a lot of them are doing that, the Audubon certification, and then they have a riparian area you know, a lot of ones that we've been to and we do not golf, but we do like to get in golf carts. <laughs> That's a dangerous <laughs> thing. But um, we don't know how to play golf. But, you know, we we're just talking about the Sabine area. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of golf courses out that way. And um, they did, it, it was in Toledo Bend area and they let us have a golf course. And was it Cypress Bend? That's right. Um, mm -hmm. Golf cart going out. And we saw all these, this, a, an abundance of wildlife because they do have the the reservoir out there and they do you know there's a golf course area but then there's this natural area where we were seeing turtles we saw scissor i think uh, some kind of scissor fly catcher or a bird scissor tail like fly catcher so do you think that kind of thing can have a balance if they're still mowing or no yeah there is a balance that you can strike with that um you know obviously they have to mow certain parts of that golf course um you know, right. so people can play in it um there's a trend towards um uh, you know, 
habitat uh, control uh, that's a little bit more softer on some of the native areas. Um, and even golf courses I've seen that have been built recently, they incorporate a lot of native berms and stuff like that, that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is definitely a balance that can to, to be, you know, that areas can strike to, to help fire flies, especially along those riparian corridors and stuff like that. Really what we want to avoid, um, and it, if you're in your local area and you're watching this um, and you're, you're looking for ways to help is just to look at places that you know fireflies might occur, whether it's a repairing corridor that's got a lot of vegetation along it, um, and look to see how people are mowing that. If they're mowing straight to the water's edge, um, and mm -hmm. then you know uh, making it look like like a manicured parkland, that's really bad for fireflies. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of habitat assessments, and sometimes I've gone into parks and cities, and they've asked me, "Well, how do we encourage fireflies?" And I, was, I said, "Well, stop mowing to the water's edge and give them a place to actually exist." Um, mm -hmm. Because you're basically just erasing their habitat and, you know, you're giving them like an inch of grass to survive in and they can't, this is not possible. So, um, you know, stopping that mowing and, and, and leaving just um, some protected areas for them um, and as much as you possibly can, you know, and people like um, uh, places that look a little wild as well uh, these days. Sure. Uh, and it, it, it signals to, to, to people that you are, have other priorities besides, you know, uh, you know, creating, making it look like a manicured park. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if you're doing a pollinator garden, uh, make it a firefly garden as well. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, if you've got a creek or a stream that's running through a particular area, um, look at what plants are there and what, you know, how you can encourage um, other species of, of insects to, to live there. Actually, you're really, really right. Mm -hmm. Not actually, but like, I'm going back to like this summer, where we saw the most uh, here has been in Maryland's been good. They did mow, but all the fireflies we saw really were around the mm. natural areas. And I, yeah. I we were mm. um, on a, a mini farm, and the lady had left uh, like these meadows just to go free. And we had wildflowers, and just mm -hmm. she, I mean, she had 17 acres, and wow. she had her house, and then a little bit of mowed area, mm -hmm. which you do want because uh, you are going to get snakes and stuff in Arkansas. But um, she left this all free, and it was amazing because there was just, it was like a sea of butterflies, and at night, fireflies. And you could tell where we would sit, mowed, which you really do want <laughs> at that place. But you look out, and actually, every, because I was trying to film the fireflies. And that's a whole other deal. And majority of them were all hanging out in the meadows. And I was like, mm. I have to get in the meadow. And I'm like, I know there's snakes in there. <laughs> I need to get in the meadow. <laughs> and then our other friends who have a bed and breakfast, I got to give a shout out, Tiffany's Bed and Breakfast. They have, and they're south of Hot Springs. I have over 60 acres they've protected of actual woodland. They have barred owls. And the first time we really wow, saw a big swath of, so cool. of, um, uh, of, fireflies it was early july nancy i think june or july mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and they had these barred owls we didn't know what kind of owls but they they were teaching their young to hunt and so they were actually going down and dipping down when the fireflies would come up mm -hmm. so we were seeing this orchestra wow. and it was all along their creek so they have their mode areas and then it's wild all around you it's one of the i mean they've got butterflies and you know humming i mean they have Everything's Everything. out there. It's magic. Yeah, see, that's a they fully were all functioning the, environment. Yeah. You know, habitat right. that's yeah. like functioning. Mm -hmm. Well, they're certified potential. wildlife yeah. habitat. I'm going to take them your sign mm -hmm. and say, like, hello, now you got to get the next one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so they are a certified National Wildlife uh, Federation thingy, uh, certified wildlife habitat, but now they could go that extra step and have the, the firefly. Because I think yeah. bed and breakfast, they're public. So these public places need to have your you know, certification so that people will, more people will do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great program. Um, and it can go hand in hand with a, you know, a wildlife habitat and a firefly habitat. Um, and it's definitely just letting people know that there's fireflies that occur here. Um, and it's worth protecting this place. Mm. When, when it, we're talking mm. about November now, um, fall season, a lot of people start taking up the leaves, raking them up. Can that hurt fireflies? Um, the, it, there can be a negative uh, benefit to that or a negative consequence from raking the leaves up. And here's why. 
Um, and I have that personal evidence from seeing this. And um, if, if you're raking the leaves up, that leaf litter is where a lot of uh, fireflies are going to be overwintering in that soil, kind of you know down in that particular area. And that leaf litter also creates habitat for the food that fireflies eat. So snails and uh, native earthworms and you know little insects and stuff like that that the larvae are going to feed on. If you remove that debris or that leaf litter, then you're basically removing, you know, it kind of more habitat for fireflies. So it's beneficial to keep some of that leaf debris in the habitat as well. It also returns nutrients to the soil mm -hmm. um, by uh, when it breaks down. Um, and so that also contributes to, you know, plant vigor and stuff like that, that fireflies need in order to hide in and, and, and you know, mate and all that kind of sort of stuff. So um, yeah, it, leave the leaf litter if you can. Um, now, Stop being you know, so manicured. <laughs> yeah, if it's like oak leaves on your grass, you know, like no big deal. But like if you're raking up, you know, below a, a big tree and, uh, you know, or in a, a more of a little bit of a native area and you're raking all that leaves up. Um, I've seen it where people actually will rake their leaves up. And then what happens is they put them in those big um, kind of paper bags to put on the curb sometimes. Um, and mm -hmm. Uh, my dad used to collect those bags to add as uh, kind of mulch for his garden. And what he would do is he'd let them rot, basically. And after years of doing that, he called me one day um, and he said, basically, hey, Ben, there's uh, fireflies in my leaf mulch. And I was like, oh, really? And so cool. sure enough, he opened one of the bags and there was larva in there. And so, you know, people had been raking the larva up and uh, leaving them in there. So, wow. Hmm. yeah, so definitely leave some of the leaf litter if you can. So when so you say that. Go ahead, Nancy. Sorry. I was going to ask, does the firefly do any kind of crop damage or any reason for us to be concerned about fireflies? Oh, that's a good question, because like um, we want to know if they're pests, basically, and like they're going to contribute mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, eating crops or anything like that. And no, there's no evidence to support cool. that they uh, eat any type of crops or anything like that. You know, in the larval state, they might chew on roots um, and, and stuff like that. But um, they're not uh, a pest insect. If anything, they they act as kind of nature's pest control. Um, and cool. so they, they kind of help control some of the pest insects. Oh, cool. like what? Like Awesome. Do, I mean, because I was, I was wondering about the air, like if they're underground, they're maybe helping an aeration of the soil, but how are they, how are they controlling the pests, the other pests? So they're helping to control snails and slugs um, and wow. uh, those kind hmm. of things that can get out of control basically. And so the larvae are just super predacious and cool. uh, they'll consume pretty much anything. Um, and so uh, they're helping to kind of control that. And so it doesn't get out of control basically. Um, and so that's kind of how they're, they're helpful. Mm. Cool. Margo, you need some. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to put it in my compost pile. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. it. So with them being in the soil, do they help with aeration of the soil? Um, I don't think they really do that much um, okay. because they don't tunnel mm. as much as you think. A lot of times when they're in the soil and they're going to pupate or uh, they're overwintering, they're creating like a, a kind of a, a mud uh, basically sack essentially, uh, that they're living in for that time frame. And so, oh. you know, if you really want to find fireflies mm -hmm. during the winter, you can find larva, but you got to really dig in the mud and get your hands dirty, um, in order to, to do that. When did they come mm -hmm. out? Um, so each, each, uh, region is different. Um, but, um, mm -hmm. in the Southern States and the Southern climates, um, they'll come out like about April, May timeframe. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with the, the, the amount of sunlight that they get um, in the timing of the year. Um, they're very sensitive to the, the, the rainfall and then like uh, warmth and stuff like that. And they're looking for the right trigger to come out. Um, so in the Southern states mm -hmm. down here, you know, we'll get them like early April, May. Um, and in some places they see them as early as March for certain genuses wow. that will come out. Um, and, and that, you know, you, they can even see that up in like Tennessee area and uh, some places in the mid Atlantic. Um, but 
in places like in the Mid-Atlantic uh, and those eastern states in the United States, they'll have a pretty pronounced firefly season that will kind of start to peak around July timeframe, depending upon the year, um, and then kind of peter off after that. Uh, and uh, in Texas, for example, where I'm located, we'll generally have a season that lasts from around end of April to around July timeframe, uh, just depending mm -hmm. upon how hot it get, gets. And then they'll come back basically um, around September timeframe. Um, and then kind of carry on into the end of October. Um, there's there's been times where I've seen fireflies in every month except wow. for Janu January. Oh wow! Mm. Yeah. So you were talking uh, last time we chatted with you, and and this wasn't on recording, but you were talking about glowworms, and there's a cave in New Zealand of glowworms. Mm. Like, are they related? Like glowworms, the same? Like. Because this, yeah, this cave, I want to go in this cave. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. they're everywhere. They're just dripping down with just glowy dripping, stuff. dripping weird. glowworm stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's a good question because bioluminescence is so fascinating. So, like, yeah, you know, forms of bioluminescence, like in the in the world, um, in the ocean, mm -hmm. we have to, it. Yeah. yeah, the fish that glow. Yeah, the fish that glow. Um, and so, because it's kind of a rare trait, you know, if you think about it, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. how do these mm -hmm. um, insects develop the ability to flash? You know, there's other, there's another beetle uh, family that also glows as well. Um, it's in the oh. clip beetle family. Um, and so I get oh. questions about that often. But back to the New Zealand caves, that's actually a fly larva. Um, so they're not directly related. Um, mm -hmm. And they do glow. And I believe that's um, the larval state that is glowing and kind of dripping down from the caves. Um, mm -hmm. and so I've, I've, I've heard really fantastic things. And um, the light is a little weaker from what I understand from people that have visited it. Um, uh, but um, it, it's still like, you know, one of the uh, uh, species or insect that does like kind of glow. Uh, fireflies mm -hmm. are unique in their flash pattern specifically and, and their ability to regulate that flash pattern. So they're the disco, so, the disco kings yeah. and queens, yeah. right? So how do they glow? I mean, do they have yeah. a charging station they have to line up with at night? <laughs> Is no. there a Tesla charging station nearby? I know, like, my mind went to Elon with... Musk immediately. I'm I know. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do they? <laughs> uh, do good they question. To... Yeah. Um, it's fascinating to study how fire slice flash. And essentially, it's uh, it, it happens like this. There's uh, an amino acid and an enzymatic catalyst, basically, uh, that works together to... Uh, contribute to the flash and it's one's called luciferase and the other one's called luciferin um, and that luciferin molecule kind of fits into that amino acid essentially and as the firefly breathes in oxygen what it does mm -hmm. is it charges up that molecule um, and you can mm -hmm. kind of think like it, it kind of nests inside it um, and once that molecule gets charged up with those those ions um, basically it, it releases them, uh, the oxygen ions, and basically that's what creates the light through a, a chemical mm. uh, formula. Um, and so they control this by breathing in, um, and that's how they're able to regulate oh. the flashing. If you ever look at a firefly up close, you turn it over and look at its abdomen. If you look on those abdominal segments right there, um, you'll see what kind of looks like miniature lightning. And you, that's kind of how you can kind of think about it, because there's a lot of those um, amino acids in, in in, in enzymatic catalysts that are working in there in order to flash. Um, and they're not all working at the same time, um, but uh, when they're breathing in and they're releasing it, um, it it's pretty interesting to see. Uh, mm. So, uh, you know, the, the structure of that molecule, that amino acid, basically uh, that the differentiation in structure of it between luciferin and luciferase can contribute to different colors as well. So oh, if there's a slight wow. change in that chemical structure or that, the way it's it's made um, will contribute to make it more orange or more yellow or more red, cool, for example. Wow. Um, That's party. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, so it's it's pretty fascinating. Cool. People have been fascinated by it for for many years. They used to harvest fireflies uh, for scientific research to harvest those chemicals uh, so they could use in the lab. Uh, but luckily, they can synthesize it now, and they don't need to do that. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was going to say, because, you know, I know that they're definitely entertaining and, you know, beautiful and magical, right? They're really, fireflies are magical, period. Yeah. Um, so what is the importance in the ecosystem beyond, you know, us going, oh, this is magical. We want to see fireflies in our yard and on summer nights, we want to see them. 
what is the importance for us to understand uh, the importance of making sure that they have those habitats uh, for the ecosystems? Um, what are the, what are their role in the ecosystem? Yeah, so good question. Um, you know, we also often wonder, like, what's the role mosquitoes play? And in, in uh, I do, uh, I do <laughs> wonder about that. Can you answer yeah. that? Because I'm yeah. like still not there yet. But I know, no. I, like, I know, I know bats eat them. Uh, so I would like the, the fireflies to eat the mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that would be great, right? Like, yeah, the wouldn't be awesome? they eat, the, the faster they flash or the more yeah. they flash, that would be fantastic. Cool. <laughs> um, in terms of the value that fireflies provide in the habitat, it's they act as nature's pest control in the larval state um, is because they spend so much time in that state. Um, and uh, like a lot of insects, they consume a lot of the stuff on the forest floor. Um, mm -hmm. And so that contributes to kind of a rich uh, ecosystem down there, basically. Um, and then as adults, um, some things do eat them too. Spiders, for example, um, mm. certain species of. Uh, That's why we, we have yeah. so many fireflies and spiders here. I know, because they're both <laughs> here in abundance. They're both here, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the spiders are just waiting for them in their web. They're like, come to me, come. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're an important part of, of the environment, just like uh, mm. any other. If you could think, you go to a habitat and there's like, so you see hundreds of thousands of fireflies flashing. Mm. Well, well, think that that those used to be larvae at some point crawling along mm -hmm. the forest floor eating stuff stuff like that so they're they're keeping things in check and so they're they're a part of the balance of a mm -hmm. healthy ecosystem um and so they they definitely are helpful especially along repairing quarters because you have to think a lot of fireflies occur in really moist areas right and a lot mm -hmm. of things like to grow in those particular moist areas so they're really critical to helping to maintain um that certain pest populations don't get out of control and and so on mm -hmm. and so um, yeah, they definitely are helpful um, in, in many ways. Yeah, I cool. think that's important too, talking about riparian areas because um, they're they're in dire straits. Our riparian areas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, our wetlands are just not at the numbers that they should be, and at the same time, battling you know invasive species. There's a lot of times you'll go to a swampy area and you see all these beautiful purple flowers and you realize oh they're not supposed to be there you know yeah. so we have that and so mm -hmm. that sh the shift happens in the ecosystem I don't know what's going to happen in the future if we're just going to be all non-native anymore or what's going to happen to everything you know because it there's that balance that nature provided where okay the firefly when it's in its larval is going to eat this snail over here that's going to eat that plant but now that plant's gone Mm -hmm. so that's a that's an important thing you know mm -hmm. so right. um, their, their borders are not like ours no. you know they have a completely different way of discerning borders that mm -hmm. you know if there's our borders don't match right so i think yeah. we should just get rid of borders but anyway yeah you're cool. in texas i'm not supposed to say that and you're in san diego mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Where we are, there's no borders. So I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. So and then to your point, yeah, I mean, there's uh, a whole lot less uh, habitat, you know, unique habitat left. And so that's why this habitat certification oh. program is so valuable just to, you know, uh, if, if uh, to know what to value, basically. And it's a good way to signal to that and, in, and, and help save areas that need protection uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a fun fact, there's about 14% of North American firefly species are either threatened um, or potentially uh, near extinction at some point. Oh. So, um, you know, there's a, uh, there's a research done by the International Conservation for the Union of Nature and Xerxes that looked at a wide swath of firefly species and I contributed for Texas. And, you know, they found that about 14% of species are about are vulnerable. So um, that signals mm -hmm. um, that- that's, a, that's big. That's actually, that's, when you think of actual species, that's not just like, hey, a percentage that's of huge. fireflies. That's right. species. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Wow. So uh, there's uh, a definite need and um, for, you know protection for it, and you know, and, and on invasive species too. That uh, I discussed that in the guide a bit, um, and in terms of like helping to like you know remove invasive species as you can. You really want to remove those that create really big monocultures, like just really big stands of like plants that shouldn't be there that are basically yeah. creating a large monoculture that not, not giving a lot of economic value to the environment in general. Um, so mm. those are things that you want, we want to, to kind of like look at. 
and they call in um, pests that are pests, insects and others that would normally not go there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So well, we're causing, yeah. yeah, we're causing a migration. I, I'm just thinking back to Yuma and the white fly. Mm -hmm. Yuma planted all these peanut plants and mm. they never had white fly before they did that. When they made it a monoculture, suddenly Yuma had a white fly problem. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they didn't have it before. They only had it well, after. Well, huh. they grow lettuce. They're the, the winter lettuce, mm -hmm. you know, capital. And so the lettuce won out over the peanuts. Yeah. Um, but you, you can now go but, to the peanut patch and still get peanuts, but it, they don't grow yeah. them anymore because the lettuce is such a, you know, economic thing. But mm -hmm. they at least cleaned up their part of the river, uh, yeah. the Colorado River, and, mm -hmm. and cleaned up a lot of... So I wonder about fireflies out there. I never, there's a lot of mosquitoes, <laughs> but, yeah, but they've really it's done a lot out there, which is, and I think this is an amazing thing to think about fireflies. So people can go to firefly.org and then I, was it $49 to get certified? Uh, 45, um, and 45. go to firefly.org and click on the certify uh, link at the top um, there, mm -hmm. and then you'll see the page. And yeah, it's it's 45, and uh, the sign will be shipped to you. There's a guide that you can download that's included with it mm -hmm. uh, that, that mm -hmm. I wrote, and then you'll get my own personal support. So you can email me, have any questions, uh, want me to look at photos or advice on terms of like helping improve your habitat. I'd be I'd definitely helpful and happy to do that. So so over the holidays, people can do this as a gift. Yeah, right? a great gift, especially cool. for somebody that's really interested in nature and specifically mm. for somebody that's like really hard to buy a gift for. Um, and uh, <laughs> this is a, mm -hmm. a great new thing. Um, and so I've had a couple of people come to me and they're like, Ben, this is great. Like I have this friend and she's got this, you know, pollinator garden and she's just really, you know, this would be a perfect thing for her. So um, yeah, a great, mm. great gift for the holiday season. Yeah, I, I love awesome. it. So, Margo, any questions for Ben? I know you had no, doggies. I, in there. <laughs> I know I had to mute she myself. She was juggling doggies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the and the, the gardener. <laughs> was, oh, see, so, uh, yeah. So, don't say he was mowing. Ben might have to go I'm over sorry, from no, Texas. Not, not allowed to mow in the backyard, but he was well. He shouldn't do that either. Using the blower, oh, which is noisy. Uh -oh. yeah. 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 So, yeah. So yeah, no, no uh, this you are so uh, informative on the show. I really have no questions. So. <laughs> no, it's like Good. you know everything uh, about it. Yeah, now. I I knew nothing about it when I uh, signed on, and now I'm. I'm quite knowledgeable. So I know I, it's I think we forget about we amazing. think about fireflies as kids, but we always forget like these kind of species and mm -hmm. where are they? And that's something, you know, as we travel across and the first time we saw fireflies, I think it was Kentucky, and we saw one and I was just like, no. And I we saw them in Africa and everything. And I know mm -hmm. there's species all over the world, but it was just like this magical thing. And you know, everywhere we've gone here, they've they've got an abundance. And other places, they're like, well, we haven't had the same amount of fireflies over the years. Over right. the last five to 10 years, we're mm -hmm. seeing a decline. So I think, you know, it's something cool to get communities together. So if we had like, you know, we have all these parks, people are doing city parks and you know, all that. They need to have more of a natural area too, just like mm -hmm. a natural habitat is mm -hmm. another thing. So I'd like yeah. to see, obviously, everybody in their homes doing that in their garden, but let's like even apartment complexes i think condos and apartment complexes and those kind of places we need to see more of that happening in those areas where there's mm -hmm. multiple people living in one you know community um they have green areas for the people a lot of times sometimes not but if we can do this it would be quality of life for families mm -hmm. as well as for, for the fireflies mm -hmm. yeah for everyone yeah so I just, you know, I always just kind of think it's not just people with backyards, you know, there's actual, all the corporate people, you need to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Coming after you. Yeah. But mm -hmm. Ben, thank you so much, everyone. Again, go to firefly.org is the website, be certified, get on the firefly wagon. I mean, we're talking about the holiday season now. And I would just, you know, when you think, think about twinkly lights, I'm saying fireflies are better. And so let's oh, invest so much in them. More for, fun. Yeah, it's a great New Year's resolution. They move. Too. It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs>
Um, also, we want to thank Margot Carrera. Uh, Margot's awesome on the shows. And uh, this has just been so much fun over this year with this series. And we wanted you to go to her website, mm. uh, talking about gifts um, for the holidays, like, you know, wrap yourself in nature. She's got beautiful uh, photography, mm. artwork, and all kinds mm. of gifts. And you can go to CarreraFineArtGallery.com for that. We're here every fourth Friday with Margot. And Keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And here it is. Here's to the force of the firefly. <laughs> <laughs> okay.